A crude oil tanker arrived at a port in northwest Europe to load 1.5 million barrels of Brent export crude oil that was to be discharged at Savona, Italy. The officer in charge began loading at 4,000 cubic meters per hour. As everything appeared to be in order, the loading was increased to 17,500 cubic meters per hour. Soon after the full rate was reached, the crew heard a loud, continuous rattling in the middle of the manifold that resonated along the cargo pipelines. Unknown to the officer in charge, two of the three manual manifold valves that were required to be fully open were only half opened, while the third was left closed due to a misunderstanding. As the crew members inspected the pipeline to find the source of the noise, they heard a loud bang and the loading arms shuddered alarmingly. Within moments, a light crude oil was seen spraying out of the connection between one of the loading arms and the manifold. An alarm was then heard on the jetty, and the loading was suddenly stopped. Investigations revealed that a spindle of number two manifold valve had sheared, and the valve disc had slammed shut, suddenly restricting the flow. As we go through, we will learn why the valve disc spindle sheared and, more importantly, how it could have been avoided. Crude oil tankers are designed to transfer cargo at a high loading rate, but the operation must be conducted in a controlled manner. If not, large hydrodynamic forces with high transient pressures can develop that the cargo handling system may not be designed to resist. Some terminals are able to load at rates of up to 16,000 meters cubed per hour. Putting this into perspective, this is the rate of filling 5,000 cars with fuel simultaneously. When handling cargo at such high rates, it's important to recognize how to control flow rates in order to avoid undesirable events. Let's start by looking at the adverse situations that can occur during loading operations. Then we will identify the control measures you can put in place when loading at high flow rates. We will also look at how to ensure proper venting and the correct measures to put in place when controlling the filling of cargo tanks during topping off. Throughout, we'll use this cargo control console to indicate what you need to monitor during the loading operation. We're also going to look at the practical aspects of controlling flow rates so that you can play your part in a safer, more efficient loading operation. Considering the high flow rates that can be reached during loading operations, things can go seriously wrong if the operation is not properly monitored and controlled. Let's have a look at some of these issues. When the vessel requests minimum rate, loading is often started by gravity into a single tank. This means that there is no pump involved. Depending on the level of the terminal's tank or its height above sea level, there may be occasions where it's difficult for the terminal operator to adjust the flow rate accurately. In some cases, the flow rate can be greater than that requested, causing it to be higher than the maximum permissible single tank rate. When this happens, it's better to commence loading in two tanks rather than one as it will ensure that the maximum permissible single tank flow rate is not exceeded. The same is true during the topping off process, where the actual rate is greater than the minimum flow rate that has been requested. In this situation, it may be better to finish loading using two last tanks instead of one. When loading cargo, pipeline leaks are always possible. Once loading has started, the most likely source of a cargo leak is the connection between the terminal's loading arm or hose and the manifold flange. Generally speaking, when loading through hard arms with quick couplers, the O-ring seals are quite often a source of leakage. If sections of the ship's cargo piping have been removed on the ballast passage or at a repair facility, then even when it has been successfully hydro-tested with water, Crude oil leaks can still occur from flanged connections. Expansion couplings, such as dresser type connections, could also be the source of leakage, especially if the rubber seals have been damaged or eroded. Leaks can also occur when the ship moves due to continuous flexing in heavy weather.
Leakage can also occur if the cargo lines have been pressurized due to expansion when the pipelines have not been drained properly from the previous cargo. Similarly, pressure and temperature gauge connections can be a source of leakage. If they are not tightly fitted or the connections are cross threaded, flow rates that are consistently higher than those permissible can result in pipeline erosion and can eventually result in localized leakage. This is caused by turbulent flow through pipes where there are T joints, V configurations, and bends. The amount of erosion will depend on whether the pipe is protected by a paint coating and the roughness of each pipe's internal surface. High flow rates can also cause damage to the seals in cargo butterfly valves. Valves of this type are typically rated at 6 meters per second velocity flow rate. If the flow rate is above this, the crude oil will erode the valve seals, especially when it has high sediment content, eventually causing the cargo to leak through closed valves. During loading, the levels in tanks that are partially or fully filled with cargo will always change slightly. Often, this is caused by changes in trim or list, but it might indicate very small bulkhead or valve leakages. This would be shown by a continuous, very slight trend that must be monitored. Level changes may also be caused by hydraulic suction or filling valves creeping open very slightly because they have not been maintained properly. Pressure surges are possibly the most important effects to avoid during any loading operation. They occur when there is a sudden reduction in flow rate, often caused by a valve or valves being throttled or closed too quickly. When this happens, the pressure surges almost immediately, though the pressure rise itself will vary depending on the initial flow rate. In extreme cases, any valve, such as a swing non-return valve, can suddenly slam closed against the flow, causing a very large pressure surge. Inline valves, such as manifold or direct loading valves, are designed to be fully open or fully closed. Pressure surges can be caused by inline valves being throttled against the flow, exposing part of the valve disc to the full flow. When transferring cargo at very high flow rates, the torque on the valve spindle can be so great that it can cause it to shear. With the valve disc quickly moving to the closed position and suddenly restricting or stopping the flow, you can recognize the effects of a pressure surge when there is a sudden and unexpected rise in pressure. There is also a sudden banging or hammering sound that resonates upstream or where a valve is closed or throttled, or a shudder of pipelines, especially manifold connections, cargo hoses or loading arms. A cyclical fluctuation of pressure caused by the pressure wave oscillating in the pipe will also occur. This sudden rise in pressure can cause pipelines and hoses to split and flanges and expansion couplings to leak. Any leaks or cargo spillages can lead to a pollution incident, something we don't need to tell you about. Now that we've seen what can go wrong during loading operations, Let's take a look at some of the control measures we can put in place to avoid these operational problems. This will include several checks that may be identified in the onboard cargo handling procedures that will need to be carried out before loading commences. First, let's look at the cargo valve hydraulic control system. When checking this system, it's important that you ensure there is sufficient oil in the power pack storage tank. As you can see, this should be nearly full. This level needs to be monitored throughout loading, as a significant fall is a sign of a hydraulic leak. This could result in valve control failure. If one is fitted, the accumulator will also need to be checked to make sure it's at the required pressure. This will help maintain hydraulic pressure in the system when valves are operated. The portable hand pump for powered hydraulic valves should also be checked to ensure it is working correctly. In case there is a loss of system hydraulic pressure, failure of hydraulically actuated valves when opening or closing, or failure of associated hydraulic pressure piping. It's also important that you inspect the emergency connection ports 
making sure that they are well labelled, clean, not damaged, and lightly greased. Once the hydraulic system has been inspected, the inline cargo valves need to be set. This includes manifold valves, direct loading valves, and crossover valves. These valves are designed to be either fully open or fully closed. In the case of manually operated valves, it's essential they are checked to ensure they are actually fully open. For hydraulically actuated valves that are designed to be open to varying degrees, such as tank suction filling valves, the opening and closing times should be in line with the manufacturer's specifications. If they aren't, the valve rotational speed settings should be adjusted accordingly by a competent person. If information on valve closing or opening times are not readily available, then a closing or opening time of one second for each 10 millimeters of internal diameter of the cargo valve can be used. When it comes to level gauging systems and overfill alarms, a few things need to be checked. These include the functionality and condition of the portable ullage temperature interface gauges. If required, you must change the batteries in a non-hazardous area. Check the operation and settings of the remote level gauging system and the settings of the high and low level alarms. Under normal conditions, the high level alarm will typically be set to 95% full. If tanks are to be filled less than this, set the high level alarm to 3% below the required filling level, if adjustment is possible. You should also test the cargo tank overfill alarms. One of the most important control measures to consider is the operation of the cargo tank pressure vacuum valves, also known as PV valves. These should always be inspected and checked for functionality before loading. There should also be maintenance and testing procedures in place that are in line with SOLAS and the manufacturer's requirements. If venting through the masterizer during loading, the flame gauze should be inspected for cleanliness. Otherwise, it may restrict the passage of cargo vapor during loading. So far, we've looked at the operational problems that can arise and some of the control measures that we can put in place to prevent them. Now, let's take a look at how to determine maximum permissible flow rate, which may be requested by a loading facility. Under the Ockinf Sire Vessel Inspection Questionnaire Guidelines, it's a requirement to have the maximum loading rates and venting capacities posted in the cargo control room. But how do we determine maximum flow rates and venting capacities? Maximum flow rates are normally calculated based on the rated velocity of flow past cargo valves. The types of valves typically found on an oil tanker are Butterfly valves. These use seat rings made of neoprene rubber and are typically rated at a velocity flow rate of 6 meters per second. This is usually the limiting factor for flow rate. However, the overriding limit is the liquid level of the pressure vacuum breaker on the inert gas venting distribution pipeline. This is required to have enough capacity to accommodate the gas flow from cargo tanks of 125% of the maximum permissible loading rate. This allows for a 25% increase in vapor, which will evolve as crude enters the tank. We call this vapor growth. If your vessel is fitted with full flow pressure relief valves, they are also required to be capable of venting at 125% of the maximum single tank loading rate. Again, 25% is allowed for vapor growth. For any particular loading operation, the maximum loading rate will be determined by the number of manifolds that are being used, the pipeline loading configuration, and the number of tanks being loaded. Looking at this example of a typical maximum loading rate table for different valve types on the cargo loading pipeline system, you can see the nominal bore or internal diameter of each valve type on the pipeline system.
Against each is the maximum permissible rate based on velocity flow of 6 meters per second. The maximum permissible flow rate can be determined using a matrix for various combinations of direct loading and manifold valves. Here, you see the maximum permissible loading rate through two direct loading lines and two manifolds is 13,600 meters cubed per hour. But the maximum loading rate might be limited by the total rate of the number of tanks being loaded, based on multiples of the single tank rate. This table shows that the areas in pink are limited by the single tank rate, whereas the areas in yellow are limited by the permissible rates through the direct loading lines. Before we go on to look at other limiting factors that might make us load at rates lower than the maximum permissible limits, let's consider the following scenario. You are to load three cargo tanks through three manifolds and two direct loading lines. While these factors must be considered when determining the maximum flow rate, the overriding decision might be limited by the experience of the person in charge of the loading operation and the functionality of the valve control system. If the officer in charge is not experienced or there are any defects in the system, the cargo loading rate might need to be lower than the maximum permissible. Now that we know how to determine the maximum permissible flow rate, let's look at a typical loading operation. When you are ready for loading to begin, you should start with a minimum rate into one or two tanks, depending on whether the minimum rate possible requires two tanks to be opened. This will typically be the single tank loading rate. Once the loading has started, certain checks must be made before increasing the loading rate. There should be no cargo pipeline leaks. It's very important that any leaks that do occur are dealt with immediately. Otherwise, loading should be stopped and the situation resolved. Cargo should enter the intended tanks only and you should carefully check the level gauge readings for all other tanks to make sure they remain empty. Remember, Leaking valves or pipelines are always possible. If other cargo is on board, the ullage should not significantly change in those tanks. Any difference should be explained by changes in list or trim. When you've confirmed that there are no leaks, the cargo is entering the correct tanks and they are venting properly. The suction or filling valves on the remaining tanks to be loaded can be opened and the loading rate can be increased. When loading at high rate, it's a good idea to slowly increase the rate over around 30 minutes. Good practice is to increase the loading rate in increments based on multiples of the single tank loading rate. Before increasing each time, check for leaks, make sure the cargo is only entering the tanks being loaded and ensure that the cargo tanks continue to vent adequately. As cargo tanks fill when loading a full cargo, you should see a gradual rise in pressure in the cargo tank ullage space before it settles down to a steady pressure. Cargo pipelines on deck and in the pump room can leak crude oil at any time during the loading process. So it's important that one crew member observes the manifold connection at all times and another should systematically and regularly patrol the area with an intrinsically safe flashlight, inspecting loading pipelines from forward to aft along the whole length of the cargo pipeline on deck, checking flanged connections and blanks, including manifold blanks on the side opposite the manifold connections, expansion couplings, connections for pressure gauges and sensors, and the pressure vacuum breaker. If you're loading through the pump room pipelines, 
the same approach needs to be adopted, with all the necessary entry precautions being taken. During loading, you must always monitor tank levels of filled tanks that are not being loaded with cargo. If adjustment is possible, the high level and low level alarm settings should be set either side of the actual cargo level, with the tolerance range based on any likely increase in temperature or any changes in ullage and trim. It's also essential that you monitor empty cargo tanks that are not being loaded. At any time during loading, cargo can enter tanks not being loaded through leaking suction filling valves, pipelines or through oil tight bulkheads. Sometimes it's only when the cargo in a tank has reached a certain level that it might exert enough pressure on pipes and valves in cargo tanks for leakage to start or become obvious. That any leakages become obvious. Now we've looked at determining maximum permissible loading rates, let's look more closely at another essential part of the process. Venting. When loading is carried out with venting through the mast riser, it's a SOLAS requirement that the isolation or stop valves on the inert gas venting distribution pipeline are locked open. And the overall opening and closing is controlled by the officer in charge of the cargo transfer operation. This is typically the chief officer. It's important for the officer conducting loading operations to be aware of the capability of the primary and secondary venting system during loading. Crude oil tankers are generally designed to vent cargo vapors during loading through a mast riser. This is a primary venting system. Some crude oil tankers are fitted with vapor emission control manifolds. Where mast riser venting is used as the primary venting system during loading, a full flow pressure vacuum valve needs to be fitted as a secondary means, which must be able to vent cargo vapor volumes at a rate of 1.25 times the maximum permissible flow rate in the cargo tank. However, a smaller capacity pressure vacuum valve may be fitted, though this will only be designed to cope with small changes in the volume of cargo vapor or inert gas due to thermal variation. In this case, each tank must be fitted with pressure sensors, allowing the pressure to be monitored from the cargo control room. The approved VOC management plan will fully describe the arrangements on board. When loading, the officer controlling the operation needs to recognize an appropriate trace to expect on the inert gas pressure recorder. During loading, when venting through a mast riser, the escape of vapor can be obstructed due to wax, oil or sludge deposits blocking the flame gauze. This can happen when the previous cargo has been paraffinic crude, which has a high wax content, or aromatic crude, which has a high pour point, and there has been overcarry into the venting system, which has solidified after attaching to the flame gauze. When you are loading through high velocity vents at high pressure, the vents may have been blanked for maintenance. If the blank has not been removed or not set to the required venting pressure, this could result in overpressurizing of the cargo tanks. If you are in control of the loading operation, it's your responsibility to ensure that cargo tanks are adequately vented. The continual but slow rise of pressure is a sign that venting is inadequate and the loading rate must be reduced or the loading operation stopped. On some occasions, loading must be carried out using volatile organic compound emission controls for local environmental requirements. When this is the case, you should maintain as high a tank pressure as possible by throttling the mast riser valve to minimize vapor emissions and minimize the evolution of vapor in the cargo tanks. The generally accepted tank pressure to maintain is 70% of the setting of the pressure vacuum relief valve. Typically, this is 96 millibar. However, this will be stated in the approved VOC management plan. When loading using a Vapor Emission Control System or VEX, the loading facility will specify the tank pressure requirements and loading rate.
The tank pressure must always be positive when connected to the facility's vapor system. Tank pressures of between 10 and 80 millibars typically need to be maintained by controlling the loading rate. So far, we've looked at how to load crude oil at the maximum permissible rate and the control measures to put in place to ensure that it's done safely and effectively. One of the last things to consider is how to complete the loading operation. When approaching topping off, it's important that you monitor the ullage and control the filling rate in centimeters per minute. Not doing so could result in a poor tank level stagger arrangement, which could cause problems carrying out topping off in a controlled manner. Under most circumstances, the levels in cargo tanks will stagger naturally from aft to forward with stern trim. This means that the ullages of cargo tanks being loaded are successively greater from aft to forward. In some cases, the loading configuration might require that the stern trim is maintained by keeping ballast in the segregated ballast tanks to allow a natural stagger. There may be times when you are loading a part cargo at even keel. In this case, you will need to throttle filling valves to ensure a suitable stagger for topping off. With suction filling valves in the forward tanks throttled in the most and those at the aft end fully opened. Well staggered tanks allow the systematic topping off of center tanks and pairs of wing tanks from aft to forward. A poorly staggered tank arrangement will result in tanks being topped off in a random order or at the same time. When topping off, tank filling rates need to be carefully monitored in centimeters per minute. 5 cm per minute maximum is a good guide, providing the single tank volumetric flow rate is not exceeded. However, during topping off, any remote level gauging system should never be totally relied upon for determining a cargo tank ullage. Portable UTI gauges must be placed in position and continually compared with the remote level gauging system until a tank is topped off. The position of each cargo suction or filling valve should also be monitored, as well as the pipeline pressure at the manifold. As tank filling or suction valves are closed when they reach the final ullage, more flow will be allowed into the remaining tanks and the tank filling rate in centimeters per minute will increase. When a single tank's flow rate is too high, it can cause damage to the suction filling valve due to the increased velocity flow rate. The tank's venting capacity may also be exceeded, or it might present difficulty in topping off the tank to the correct ullage. The position of valves needs to be monitored extremely closely. A limited number of valves must remain fully open depending on the flow rate, but closing too many valves too quickly can cause a pressure surge. When closing butterfly valves, the flow rate remains more or less unchanged until the position of the valve reaches 40% of the fully open position. Below that, the flow rate reduces significantly. Prior to changeover, there may be occasions when the filling rate can be controlled by partially opening the suction or filling valves and bleeding some of the flow to the next group of tanks to be loaded. When hydraulic valves are in use prior to changing over to the next tank or tanks that are to be loaded, the suction or filling valves should be briefly opened and closed again. This is to check that they will open when the time comes to change over.